Hello and welcome to a how-to guide for Muslim representation in video games. My name is Osama Dorias. I'm a Muslim. I'm happily married and a father to three beautiful children. I'm a senior game designer at Warner Brothers Games Montreal, a game design teacher at Dawson College, the co-founder of the Montreal Independent Game Awards, and one of the three Habibis on the Habibis podcast. These are some of the games that I've worked on in my 14 years in the industry. I've shipped mobile, console, PC, VR, and even airplane games. Today I'm going to speak about why Muslim representation is important. I'll also go over uh, a few select misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. And then I'll jump into the meat of the session, the how-to guide. I'm not here to convince you that not all Muslims are bad. I sincerely hope that no one who's watching this believes this. I'm also not here to start shaming people or companies that have misrepresented Muslims. I've worked on games that misrepresented Muslims myself. Sometimes it's very hard not to conform at a workplace. So there's no shaming involved. I'm not even shaming the powers that be that make these calls. Sometimes they just don't know better, and that's why we're here after all. So why is this topic so important? To illustrate this, please permit me to start at the very beginning of my story. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. My family left right before the start of the Iraq-Iran war. We traveled the world for years before falling in love and settling in Montreal, Canada when I was five years old. I've been living here ever since, a proud Quebecois and Canadian. I grew up between worlds. I was completely enamored with entertainment, movies, comics, video games. To me, my love of entertainment and the love of my faith held no conflict. There was room in my heart for both. And that's not to say that there's no conflict in my heart early life when it comes to identity. My family ate halal, and as a result, I had hamburger envy. You see, when I was a child, halal hamburger restaurants weren't a thing. Not in Montreal. My parents tried their best to give us what we wanted, though. So my mom would make us homemade burgers. But, you know, I couldn't be sure that they were the same as the real ones that I saw on TV. And my dad would take us to McDonald's for fish burgers, but they didn't make commercials about those. When I finally had my first real burger, I felt so underwhelmed. I mean, it tasted fine, but it didn't taste as good as I'd imagined. And of course, the burgers are just a symptom. It was just one of the many ways that I felt like an outsider in the only home I've ever really known. The 80s and 90s were especially difficult because every other action movie that came out unapologetically depicted Muslims as the villains. Despite loving Hollywood movies generally, I was never given the chance to love Indiana Jones or Back to the Future because those movies vilified Muslims, and in so doing, they misrepresented me. It's no coincidence that the X-Men were my favorite comic book superhero team. They were a group of outcasts that were feared and hated by the world that they were trying to protect. My Islam was one of spreading love and understanding, tolerance and peace, not the one portrayed in Hollywood. To me, Muslims were just misunderstood, just like the X-Men. Video games were my safe haven, because early on they rarely ever mentioned Muslims at all. Of course, that changed drastically with the rise in popularity of the first-person shooter. In 2007, I landed my first job in the game industry. Though I worked with wonderful people that I grew to love, those were different times. The language of inclusivity and diversity was still in its infancy. I didn't have the tools or the vocabulary that I, were necessary to explain to others the impact of their words. Uh, I'm talking about like well-meaning comments like, you're one of the good Muslims, or jokes about me being a closet terrorist. They cut me deeper than I let on. But more about that later. An interesting thing that happens between game designers is that we often exchange stories of when we realized that we wanted to be game designers. Most of them give answers ranging from 3 to 10 years old, pretty much at the age that they were exposed to video games. I was 7 years old when my parents bought me my first console. It was a Sega Master System. However, I only realized that game development was a career option for me at the age of 27, 20 years later. Why is this? My parents wanted my seven siblings and I to become doctors and engineers. Yes, it's a very Arab stereotype. 
My dad was an engineer himself. Five of my siblings are now engineers. None of us are doctors to my mother's eternal disappointment. And why is this? Other than the promise of prosperity in this life, doctors and engineers bring a tangible value to society. They heal our wounds and build our cities. My parents' generation looked at media with contempt and disdain. It seemed like the media was out to get us, after all. Why would we want to join their ranks? However, I was an avid consumer of movies, comics, and video games. My parents even encouraged these hobbies from their point of view, they kept me out of trouble. I loved them so much that I would draw my own comics when I was very young. I would make board games out of empty pizza boxes. I was pretty proud of those. They were both the board and the box. I would make levels for my favorite video games. And yet the thought never crossed my mind that I would could do this professionally someday. I decided to become a game designer because my friend Ahmed Saad became a game designer. Ahmed was Arab like me, brown like me, and Muslim like me. That's, that's what happened. I saw him. It's very simple. Something clicked in my head, and all of a sudden I was able to visualize myself in a career that was the natural ev evolution to the many passions and hobbies that I had throughout my life. Within a year, I had my first job in the industry. I was very fortunate. I worked at a company with 500 employees, and there was only one other Muslim. And as I mentioned before, I heard my fair share of Islam Islamophobic comments early in my career. But I was a junior with no real authority, and as most juniors do, do, I kept my head down. I loved my job, and I didn't want to do anything to jeopardize it. Studies show that people with Muslim-sounding names are offered a third of the interviews that people with Western-sounding names are offered. They are then offered half as many jobs after the interview process. And honestly, that's not even the worst of what we have to deal with. Islamophobia is on the rise. It peaked in the Western world after September 11, 2001. It started to die down, but recently we're seeing a, sh a sharp surge in Islamophobia once again. Incidents tend to happen on the street, but they also take place in mosques and in workplaces and in schools. Most of the victims are women, most of the perpetrators are men, and 10% of cases are of extreme violence. In 2017, there was a shooting in a mosque in Quebec City, a city not too far from Montreal, from our city, where six people lost their lives while praying. And in 2019, there was a shooting in a mosque in New Zealand that claimed 50 Muslim lives. Studies show that at least 15% of Muslim children hide, hide their faith out of fear of being targeted. I'd wager that many more would hide their faith if they had names or skin complexions that would allow them to do so. Muslims have a public image problem. It's sometimes dangerous to be a Muslim. Good intentions sometimes have bad results. In my life, I've had many people give me the compliment of being one of the good Muslims. I used to thank them and take it in stride because it was it can be quite emotionally taxing to explain microaggressions to someone who isn't familiar with the concept and then follow up with an explanation of why what they said specifically was a microaggression. So the definition of what a microaggression is, for those who don't know, um, it's a commonplace verbal or behavioral indignities, whether intentional or unintentional which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults at the expense of marginalized groups. And this phenomena isn't limited to everyday people, of course. Often, people in powerful positions make these same mistakes. So please bear with me as I read you some of these comments. We need to be cooperating with Muslim nations and with the American Muslim community. They're on the front lines. They can provide information to us that we might not get anywhere else. If we are to succeed in defeating terrorism, we must enlist Muslim communities as much as our strongest allies, rather than push them away through suspicion and hate. Report. Enlist. Front lines. 
I've been a Muslim all my life. I have never met a terrorist. I wouldn't know where to go to meet one. I'm not on any front lines. Stop militarizing us. This is a tweet from a British Muslim teen that went viral. For better or worse, this is the kind of problems that Muslims are dealing with. They're the same problems as non-Muslims would go through. We need you to be our allies, not the other way around. Now I'm going to give you some examples of misrepresentation from movies that you might have seen. The movie The Siege is about a terrorist attack on New York. The perpetrators in the movie are Muslim. So is one of the CIA agents um, looking to bring them to justice. Agent Frank Haddad is shown to be drinking and isn't very religious when he's on screen, which in and of itself won't really be a problem. The issue is the association. Everyone who's a terrorist in the movie was ultra-religious and everyone who's a good person was as Western as possible. The message this sends is that you can be a Muslim, but not too Muslim. Some Muslims practice more than others, and that's okay. In the movie Three Kings, there's a disturbing scene where an Iraqi woman is shot point blank in the head. I'll spare you the graphic visuals. This is used to paint the American soldiers in the movie in a positive light, to show their cause as being just and noble. Now, it's not all wrong. 97% of the victims of terrorism are Muslim, so it's not a lie. But when you have a movie that only shows Muslims as victims and villains, you're justifying war. We send people to liberate Muslims, and if Muslims' lives end up being collateral, well, that's what we're there for anyway, right? Solely portraying Muslims as victims justifies wars that make us victims. It's very simple. Now, I'd like to take some time to debunk a few misconceptions about Islam and Muslims. I could talk for hours about these mis misconceptions, so I've only chosen a few that I believe most people don't, don't know about. Most Muslims live in these countries. I mean, Muslims live all over the world. I live in Canada. But the biggest Muslim populations are in these countries. Fewer than 15% of Muslims are Arab. And by this I mean people whose primary language is Arabic. This number increases slightly if you include people who speak Arabic as a second language. The largest Muslim country is Indonesia. A country we rarely ever hear anything about. And Muslims in India alone number 204 million. And they account for 14% of the population of Muslims. So what does a Muslim look like? Now, before I answer this question, uh, does it conjure up an image in your head? Hold on to that image. It's a normal reaction. Your mind is quickly constructing an image based on memories and depictions of Muslims that you've seen in the past. Now, let me ask you another question. What does a Christian look like? What does an atheist look like? It's much harder to nail down just one look for these two groups because you have a much larger sample base to pick from. You probably imagine someone who looks like this, with varying degrees of dress. It's possible that you remember the Muslim that you know personally as well, and that would be preferable. You might even have conjured up a less stereotypical depiction of a Muslim. But Muslims also look like this. We can and we do often look like you. I'm going to show you a series of people and please just take a second and think about whether you believe this person is a Muslim or not. Let's see if you could spot a Muslim. This person is Sikh. This person is Hindu. This person is Christian, Syrian Orthodox Christian. This person is Jewish, Ethiopian. And this person is a Buddhist. Now, any one of these people could have been Muslim. They all come from countries with a large number of Muslims. 
Muslims wear turbans and saris and headscarves as well. It's only in the small details that you can tell from the dress whether it's a Muslim or not. Muslims are diverse, just like everyone else. So now let's get to the meat of the session, the how-to guide. So please keep in mind that the topic has a certain degree of subjectivity. So if you speak to a Muslim and they disagree with a the point, they're also correct. You know, not one person holds the truth for an entire community. These are some Muslim comic book characters from the past. A ragtag assortment of bad jokes and stereotypes, mostly villains, all poorly designed and shallow and outright insulting. Then we finally had a chance to tell our own story. This is Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, created by a pair of Muslim women, G. Willow Wilson and Sana Amanat. When it launched in early 2014, Wilson and Amanat only planned out the first three issues. They were fully expecting Marvel to cancel it before it got any further. The comic became a huge hit, as well as Marvel's first ongoing series starring a Muslim character. It's been running for over five years now, and Kamala is what happens when we write our own stories. Kamala normalizes the North American Muslim plight by bringing it into the mainstream, the clash of cultures and values and traditions. Our youth really needed this. But Kamala also allowed non-Muslims to have a glimpse into the lives of North American Muslims, demystifying our world and building bridges of understanding. Remember, Muslim children often hide their faith. Our youth didn't want it known that they were Muslim. Now everyone wants to be Kamala. We don't have our video games version of Kamala Khan yet. I mean, we kind of do. Uh, we have Kamala herself in some games, and we're really grateful for that. But we don't have our own Muslim character introduced in a video game that's spreading awareness on a mainstream scale. Herein lies opportunity, who will be the first to reach this growing demographic and make so much positive change. We need you to give us a platform. We need you to amplify our voices. One of the things I think developers worry about is offending their Muslim staff by asking us about details and how the game could represent us. It's more offensive not to ask and do something that misrepresents us. Keep that in mind. So please talk to us. And of course, there's a measure of emotional labor that comes with this. So when you reach out to Muslims, please be aware that um, of that and allow them to like decline. It's possible that they don't want to. And just make that easy for them to say either yes or no. But don't let that stop you from asking initially. And of course, there's a desire for people now to have representation in their games, and that's a good thing. But word of advice, don't stack tokens. And what I mean, what I mean by this is that uh, if you have a game with a lot of different characters, don't make one of them uh, like a paraplegic black Muslim woman is an example that I use, and then have everyone else in your cast just be a white male. I mean, I don't take the wrong message away from this. I'd love to hear the story of a black paraplegic Muslim woman. But don't expect that one character to check off every representation box and then you think your job is done. That's not how representation works. And if you do have such a complex character, then try your best to find someone who, whose reality is as close to that character as possible and hire them as a consultant. And above all, make sure that this isn't your only character that isn't a straight white male. One easy thing developers can insist on is authentic casting. Though I did love Aladdin as a child, I mean, it has a lot of problems, but um, I was willing to take my non-horrible representation any way I could get it, to be honest. The one thing that bothered me the most is that Aladdin didn't really sound like me. I mean, what's worse? In Aladdin, most of the people who had Arabic accents were villains. The heroes all sounded white. Let's take Egyptian sniper Anna Amari in the video game Overwatch as a great example of voice acting done right. Blizzard hired Egyptian actress Aisha Salim to play the part. Not only does it 
do the character justice, but it also helps her stand out from the rest of the cast in a recognizable way. What's also notable is that they, use, they cast a, an actress who sounded like she could be the character's same age. She, she was age appropriate, which in itself stands out in a medium where most characters seem to be in their 20s and 30s. So there are actual gameplay reasons why this is a good idea. Add us to your rosters. So if you have a game with different playable characters, consider having people from Muslim countries. These characters might not even be Muslim and it doesn't really matter. If you represent the religion in the same way you represent the religion of other characters, example, if you don't mention the religion of other characters, then don't mention the religion of the Muslims, that's enough. I don't know if Super Street Fighter 4's Turkish oil wrestler Hakan is Muslim, and it's still enough just to represent a country that's normally not represented, that happens to be a Muslim country in this case. So just add us in your rosters. And add us as NPCs, non-playable characters. There are some excellent examples of people already doing this. There's Farida Malik from Dusex, who is a badass pilot. Sarah Hasmadi from Tacoma, who is a brilliant scientist. Dr. Farah Murad is a world-renowned engineer. And even when you're swinging in Spider-Man, you'll encounter hijabis who will greet Spider-Man warmly, though they will not hug him. And what's amazing here is when they try, uh, when he tries to hug them and they refuse, Spider-Man respects their choice. It's beautiful. It's representation done right. Running a pizza shop in Good Pizza, Great Pizza, you'll randomly encounter and serve hungry Muslims. And a nice little touch is that the Muslim character never order pepperoni. I thought that was wonderful. So we need you to include us and we need you to normalize us. Our prayers are precise. Of course, Muslim characters don't have to be unfailing pillars of virtue to be considered a good representation of the religion. In Morgan Freeman's portrayal of Azim in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, he was in exile, but he was also nuanced. He had honorable character and his own moral code, and he might have been an ideal example of how to do things the right way if Freeman had just prayed properly in the movie. Muslim prayers are very precise, and therefore we develop, like we as developers should strive for accuracy when depicting rituals and religious practices in the, same, in the games that we create. And if you're worried about doing it justice, it would be completely acceptable to just omit the prayer. Or as always, hire a consultant and make sure you're doing it right. Farah from Overwatch, who I mentioned briefly before, received an alternate skin when she's wearing a traditional where she's wearing a traditional Egyptian Bedouin scarf. This meant the world to Twitter user Jasmine Loves You. She says, I've been waiting all my life for this. And honestly, I've been waiting all my life for this as well. Now, if you look closely at her avatar, you'll see that it's Kamala Khan, naturally, because of course. <laughs> Overwatch did a great job representing the Egyptian Bedouin scarf. And given that there are 1.6 billion Muslims around the world, or more, depending on whose count you believe, you will definitely want to do some research. And ideally, even hire a consultant before representing the dress or culture of a specific real-world nation. Depending on the context of the character, the hijab may be a burqa or a niqab or a chador instead. However, all these options are welcome for created characters. So if people don't like that option, they don't have to wear it and that's okay. Don't identify it as something from a specific culture. Like don't say this is a Somalian headdress unless you're researching that specifically. But otherwise, have fun with it. I mean, it's an option. Anyone of any gender can wear it. Just put the option there and give people the choice. So when you see this screenshot, what country do you think this scene takes place in? Most people usually guess Iraq or Syria, but I call it Arabistan. It's a generic Middle Eastern, Southeast Asian war zone rubble place. Somewhere you wouldn't feel bad if a stray bullet hits anyone. It's rubble anyway. People are suffering anyway, so it doesn't matter. 
What this does is it desensitizes people to our reality. It dehumanizes us. When people watch the news and see a war-torn place, they recognize it as the bombed-out Arabistan that they played in a game that they with their friends, rather than the shocking aftermath of a once beautiful country, as has been the case with Syria recently. But the Middle East has no shortage of beautiful cities, and these never get any representation. This is my friend Nicholas. He tweeted about Overwatch's map Oasis when it was first revealed a few years ago. It portrayed a future Iraq that was flourishing. He shared this news with his Iraqi Canadian coworker who reacted emotionally. Now, in case it's not clear, I was that coworker. And as I mentioned before, I was born in Iraq. I think about this all the time, but I, I write about this, I speak about this but I never projected a hopeful future for my country of birth. It just, the thought didn't cross my mind. I was hoping for better, but a bright future, it, was, it felt too out of reach. And that someone else would do this in a game and set it in a future and make it, you know, a bright future, uh, it, it brought tears to my eyes at work. That's how important Muslim representation is and positive outlooks are. We need you to humanize us. The gaming industry has been making big strides when it comes to representing marginalized groups of all kinds. All we want is to be included in this conversation so that we may be better understood. And that's it. Thank you very much. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Player Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.